Hi, I'm Noah Gervais. This video is the first of what I hope will be a monthly series called Genre Orphans, about games that defy the expectations of their chosen genre and format and do something really unique and distinctive. L.A. Noir is absolutely one of those games. It takes all the formatting techniques of Grand Theft Auto and flips all of those design decisions completely on their head. It's an amazing game, for a lot of reasons. Let's talk about all of those reasons. L.A. Noir is a game that, at first glance, and only at first glance, very much resembles Grand Theft Auto, Rockstar's ultra-famous open-world crime simulation series. When you crack into it, though, you'll find a game that is a complete inversion of almost every single design priority in the GTA franchise. L.A. Noir is an open-world game where you can ask your partner to drive and skip the open world. It is an adventure game disguised as an action game. It is a game where you're a cop, not a criminal. When I was playing the game and recording footage, my girlfriend jokingly asked me, Is this one of those games where you run over the hookers? So I say to her, no. In L.A. Noir, every hooker matters to somebody. If ever there was a game at war with the tropes of its own chosen format, it's L.A. Noir. If ever there was a game that handled its internal conflict so interestingly, I haven't played it. And the conflict boils down to one fascinating difference between L.A. Noir and Grand Theft Auto. It is so much harder to make a game about being a cop than it is to make one about being a criminal. Criminality, fake digital criminality like in games, is chaos. GTA's success comes from how it effortlessly encourages chaos, both plot-driven chaos and its fun and freewheeling story, and all the emergent chaos that comes naturally from handing players tools of destruction in a sandbox environment. This chaos is fun, it's satisfying, and it's easy to market. And the police are an easy and fun mechanic to ramp up that chaos. The more chaos you sow, the harder you're pursued. The more chaos you're given the opportunity to, cr to create, until your panel truck takes a tank round and you start all over again. Series like Saints Row have made their name by being even more over-the-top than GTA in terms of random chaos. L.A. Noir, on the other hand, is a long, slow, deeply structured game about order instead of chaos and, well, law instead of criminality. It's all about its plot and its characters. There's simply nowhere else for the emphasis to go if you turn a player loose in the open world and, instead of handing them a rocket launcher, you tell them, you're a professional, goddammit, show some respect out there. So if you aren't supposed to crazy go nuts in it, why even have an open world? Especially one as absolutely massive and historically faithful as L.A. Noir's 1940s Los Angeles. The answer lies in the source material. L.A. Noir is truly a piece of faithful, credible noir media, and for noir movies, the city has always been one of the most important characters of all. To talk about that, we're going to jump into the middle of L.A. Noir to one of the DLC cases, The Naked City. The Naked City is based off of a 1948 movie of the same name, a movie that's widely considered to be one of the cornerstones of more realistic noir films, and one of the very first police procedurals ever put to film. The movie's gimmick, although it's arguably much more meaningful than just a gimmick, is that it was filmed on the actual streets in the, in the apartment buildings of New York, not on some Hollywood set. It focuses on how there are millions of things going on in the city, a heady swirl of indifferent activity, and in a maelstrom of activity like that, not all the stories will have happy endings. We see bakers opening up shops in the morning, we see commuters, businessmen, storekeeps, drunks, and we see two men drowning a young woman in a bathtub. The city is all of these things, the sum of its inhabitants, their evil as much as their good. That's the moral temperature of the film, cool, detached. The dead woman might get her justice, but she just as easily might not. A city of eight million masks many things. In the spirit that characterizes so much of Greatest Generation media, the only recourse is through determination, grit, and luck on behalf of the protagonists. The movie, although dated in its production techniques, is instantly recognizable in form. Police procedurals are their own genre because the procedures of policing are so fascinating, so unique and distinctive and structured, that movies, TV shows, and games like L.A. Noir can all adopt it and still tell original stories. The way the police work in Naked City the film is exactly the same as how they do in L.A. Noir the game. They are 67 years and two entertainment mediums apart, but they tell the same story for the same reason to the same effect. That's what's powerful about this often maligned subgenre. If the material is well considered, the execution is incredibly malleable. L.A. Noir uses its own detectives to solve the case, but the criminals and how they get caught are unchanged from the 1948 film. Cole Phelps, your detective, examines the right evidence, asks the right questions, and slowly pulls the thread until it's no longer a thread, it's a rat, and you've got the rat by the tail. The beautiful difference is that while the film lets you see the detectives puzzle it out, lets them inspect the crime scene and make the accusations, the game lets the player do it all themselves, giving an immediacy to the story that surpasses the original film. All against the backdrop of a massive, uncaring city which can't and won't ever satisfactorily reveal itself to any one person.
This tonal priority is evident when you compare how L.A. Noir uses its Los Angeles versus how Grand Theft Auto 4 uses Liberty City. Liberty City is designed to have the flavor of New York, but scaled down and made more functional for players. It's a city that's designed as an amusement park masquerading as a metropolis, and it's a hell of a convincing illusion. Around every corner in GTA 4 is a random mission, or an opportunity to make money, or a place to take Nico's friends, or to take one of Nico's many girlfriends. Everything is utilized, and a player can explore as much as they want and expect to be more or less consistently rewarded for it. Comparatively, Moore's Los Angeles is a historically accurate wasteland. Streets are based off of LA's real layout in the time before freeways changed everything about the city. You don't have a GPS, this being the late 40s, and you have to either keep an eye on the little destination flag's position on your minimap, have your partner drive and skip the open world completely, or, and this is what I think they were encouraging, you do it the old-fashioned way. Look it up on the map, remember the directions. The crime scene? You take a right on Central, drive down to 5th, make another right. Suspect's residence? North on Vermont, take a left on Rosewood, down four blocks. If you hit the gas station, you've gone too far. People have noted that the GPS in Grand Theft Auto and others in the open world format have, can reduce driving to just following the squiggly line on the minimap. Taking this away, taking away the urban streamlining that Liberty City has, and you're forced to navigate the city like it's a real place, because it was, once, long ago, a real place. One of the real thrills of watching 1948's The Naked City in 2015 is how, since it was actually shot on the streets of New York, since it did capture everyday people going about their lives, it endures as a vivid image of the city as it was, a city that's since been swallowed by time. No one will ever drive along the streets of 1940s Los Angeles again, but video games, even more than movies, are an amazing tool for cultural archaeology. It's just a digital illusion, of course, but players end up navigating this facsimile of 1940s L.A. in the same way that people did in 1940s L.A. They get a sense of the space in a similar way. L.A. Noir also dots the landscape with video game collectibles, rare cars, and film reels, as well as badges. You get achievements if that's your thing, if you go after the collectibles, but Noir's Los Angeles is absolutely huge, and the rewards are not remotely worthy of the time investment in finding them. It's better to experience the city as one more dimension of the story, to see its indifference not as a gameplay failure, but as a function of the setting and the style of Noir. There's eight million stories in the city of Los Angeles and of L.A. Noir. Phelps is just one of those stories. That's not to say the game never tries to offer the player things to do outside the primary cases. L.A. Noir lets the player flex their GTA mechanic muscles in street crime, short gameplay-focused side missions. There's a lot of them, and some are great, but most are not. They stand in real contrast to the bulk of the game, where all the dialogue is carefully considered and the tone is kept on short leash. With street crime, the tone is all over the place. Bank robbers, peeping toms, car chases! They had a lot of gameplay and could contribute to the sense of this being a city where there's always something going on, but for the most part, I I think they're kind of a misstep. L.A. Noir is very clear on the quiet, understated game that it wants to be, and street crime, along with most of the collectible items, feel like concessions to the need to have more things to brag about on the back of the box. Or the hunger that gamers who went into this title thinking it would be similar to GTA probably have for gameplay. A lot of people really, really hated L.A. Noir. If it had been formatted to be more consumer-friendly towards GTA fans, it wouldn't have been so polarizing. But it never could have been as unique as it is. And besides, it is actually quite consumer-friendly. It's consumer-friendly towards people who primarily consume adventure games. In addition to being able to ask your partner to drive and skip the open world, you can also skip over any action sequence if you fail it three times. What's left is two core mechanics, gathering clues and interrogating people of interest. The game starts Phelps off as a uniform cop while the players learn all the basic mechanics, but after that, Phelps and the player are pretty much left to figure things out for themselves. Fascinatingly, a lot of the game's best design is being reactive to mistakes that the player makes. If you fail to get information from an interrogation, you can still get that information from another source later on. There's always an objective truth to the case, a crime, a victim, and a perpetrator, and the better a player does, the more elegantly they arrive at that truth. The consequence for failure is that you arrive at the truth incompletely and have only vague proof to go with vague accusations. You win, if the game can really even be said to have a win state, by being able to paint a concrete picture of what's transpired. That's what good casework is. And Phelps, they say, is one of the best caseworkers to ever come through the department. But does that mean he's one of the best men? In a move deeply consistent with noir cinema, one of the game's biggest mysteries is trying to figure out just what kind of a man Phelps is, exactly. Is being a good cop the same as being a good person? When we meet Phelps, he sure seems like an alright sort. He's a veteran, wounded in the Pacific, honorably discharged, a war hero, they say. He's a good cop as a uniformed officer, too, efficient, if ambitious. 
So he's promoted to traffic desk as a detective and partnered with another junior detective named Bukowski. Noir uses the detectives that Phelps partners with to set the tone of that particular desk. For Phelps and Bukowski, it's all about learning the ropes and being open to unusual turns in a case if that's where the evidence leads. The very first case, for instance, is a car full of blood, but no one's hurt. It's a crime of petty greed and misdirection. Cases on the traffic desk have tremendous variety to them, the most variety of any of the desks, really. Is a hit-and-run just a hit-and-run, or had the woman already been injured before the crash? How did a luxury car owned by a foreign consulate end up in a street race? There's two DLC cases, the console's car and slip of the tongue, that make the first quarter of the game one of the most exciting and robust parts. The cases aren't connected to each other, either, unlike the next three desks. In some ways, that's too bad. The freewheeling variety of Traffic Desk and Bukowski and Phelps' open-minded enthusiasm for it is a charming mix. Bukowski isn't very warm to Phelps at first, of course. Phelps is, putting it lightly, pretty uptight and socially awkward. Bukowski has an easygoing way with people, and Phelps' hall monitor bearing rubs him the wrong way something fierce. But he does come to respect Phelps for Phelps' deductive work. He's a good cop, a good partner, straightforward, unwilling to settle for the convenient answers. Of course, that's Phelps the story character. Phelps the player-controlled character is a goddamn menace and should never have been put on Traffic Desk. Phelps the player character is solely responsible for probably half the traffic crime in the city. You see, traffic cops solve cases involving hit-and-runs, abandoned vehicles, stolen vehicles, and carjackings. You know, the core gameplay mechanics of the Grand Theft Auto franchise. Gameplay mechanics that persist in L.A. Noir. Taking those freedoms away from a player would be severely limiting. If you're going to have an open world, you need to at least let the player be creative about exploring the environment, even if you're discouraging them from destroying the environment. To at least m somewhat mitigate this disconnect, they made it so pedestrians dive out of your way, and if you deliberately try to kill random people in the street or drive a dump truck through into the crime scene, you will fail the case. you got to keep it together at least a little bit. But there's a file somewhere in Division Headquarters labeled Phelps Evil Twin that is at least six inches thick. At the end of Traffic Desk, you solve a major case, but you get your perp yanked out from under you by a shady vice cop named Roy Earl. Earl then introduces Phelps to a German nightclub singer that he thinks Phelps is going to like a lot. So then you get bumped up to Homicide Desk, and the game takes a turn in the pacing. Each desk is paced a little differently, really, but Homicide Desk is the one that most resembles a television police procedural. Your partner this time is Rusty Galloway, a senior detective with whom Phelps has a really interesting dynamic. At first, it seems like Rusty's teaching Phelps, showing him how to focus on the cases at hand and not to get lost in the big picture, but it's Phelps who ends up showing Rusty a thing or two about not being constrained by your own bias and expectations. Rusty knows two things about homicide for sure. People are liars, and it's always the husband that does it. Not always always, but crime, to Rusty, follows a familiar pattern. His approach to police work is bullish, but it's got merit to it. Rusty is very grounded in a seasoned cynicism. He's kind of representative of a lot of L.A. Noir's police force that way, willing to care, willing to put in the footwork, but only if it is absolutely clear that this isn't the same old bullshit it is day in and day out. Rusty feels like a grumpier Jerry Orbach from the original Law & Order, and it's a perfect fit for this portion of the game. Less perfect of a fit is the convictions that you make on Homicide Desk. All the cases on Homicide Desk are the works of a serial killer, based on the actual historic murder of Elizabeth Short, also known as the Black Dahlia. Through five of the six cases on Homicide Desk, you're following the clues where they lead you and arresting men based on how convincing a case you can put together against them. That's good enough for Rusty, who's enjoying closing so many cases while being partnered with Phelps. But Phelps insists a serial killer is behind it, and you're imprisoning the wrong men. This is great genre writing for procedurals, and it's every bit as good as a premium cable show in the writing department. But it's problematic for gameplay. Part of the satisfaction of Traffic Desk was always getting your man in the end, and that satisfaction is completely suspended for Homicide Desk. You do good police work, but you're putting the wrong people away. Phelps knows it, the player knows it, it is uncomfortable. If it was a TV series or a noir film, the viewer could roll with it. Obviously, the plot will address it at some point. But a player reacts differently. You discover you've got the wrong guy, the first instinct in a game is to reload the case and get the right guy, right? Then when the game says, you got the wrong guy, five-star case, well done, it feels wrong. The player is intended to get frustrated about it, of course. It makes the moment when the department finally starts listening to Phelps, and Phelps helps them put together an honest-to-God psych profile for the killer much more satisfying. But it takes a lot of bad convictions before you get to that point. This is where extra cases not connected to the serial killer plot would have really come in handy. Break up the string of dead women and unsatisfactory answers with a tidy one-off murder where you get a real confe confession from the actual killer. 
That doesn't happen, though, perhaps to preserve the momentum of the serial killer plot. It's hard to say. As much as I like Galloway, I think the homicide desk is the weakest part of the game for the muddled way it navigates Phelps as a cinematic character and Phelps as a player character. Then, when you finally catch up with the killer, you shoot him instead of arresting him, and are informed that the killer had connections upstairs. Phelps and Galloway were never to speak of it again. The, wrongly, the wrongfully convicted would be quietly released. Ambitious, unflagging Phelps would be denied his greatest victory as an officer of the law. Phelps doesn't care for that too much, and it's becoming clearer that corruption runs deeper in the department than Phelps had realized. It comes as no surprise that the next thing that happens is that you're transferred to Hollywood to work vice desk with your old pal, Roy Earl. Roy Earl is one of the game's real villains, and he's also one of the game's best characters. I've waited until talking about Earl to talk about the amazing motion capture technology that drives this game. The budget for L.A. Noir was outrageous, over $50 million, and much of it went into the process by which nuanced facial expressions can be captured and replicated. You hear that, think, oh sure, real cool, new technology, but it isn't obvious exactly how cool it is until you realize all the expressions that other games do not have. Voice actors have always done the heavy lifting for games. Facial expressions have often lagged behind. When a game finally gets it right, people notice. Like when Half-Life 2 came out and Barney greeted Gordon with a warm and knowing smile, it floored people. A smile is easy. A smile that indicates a specific attitude about two characters' past history is much more elusive and difficult to animate. Roy Earl has something that I've never seen done effectively in a game before. He's got smarm. Serious, palpable, real-world smarm in a way that makes Earl one of the most vivid characters in the whole game. And one of the most thoroughly corrupt. Galloway is not a bad cop, just an unambitious one. He doesn't want to look for answers any farther than he thinks he has to. Earl doesn't look for answers at all. He's looking for his place in the power network. As a vice cop, Earl has ten different fingers and ten different pies. He knows what seems like half the criminals in town on a first-name basis. He does police work, sure, but he does it to support the status quo that keeps him in new suits and nice Cadillacs. He's also one of the most overtly racist and sexist characters in the game, and his racism and sexism is treated as an extension of his narcissism, an extension of the selfishness that characterizes all institutionalized inequality. When he introduces Phelps to Elsa, the German singer, he slaps her because she isn't in the mood to see him. She's just received news about the death of her husband in an industrial accident. In this one moment, introducing Phelps to Elsa, just as she grieves her husband, Earl sets in motion the events that will shake the corrupt foundations of the city. But Earl has no idea. He's blinded by his self-absorption. So blind, in fact, that he can no longer effectively do police work. His reliance on a social network has atrophied his deductive skills, so he requests Phelps as a partner because Phelps is, as Earl puts it, a bloodhound. Earl can just put his feet up on the dash, let Phelps drive the caddy, and ride Phelps' coattails to success. Unless that were to somehow backfire for Earl. Earl believes everyone is corrupt. Somehow. Everyone has their vice. Even Phelps. Vice Desk is where the game's plot really begins picking up speed, and starts confronting players with a question it had been slowly guiding them towards for a while. How well do you, the player, really know Cole Phelps? Back on Homicide Desk, Galloway asks a question, casually, during a car ride that has far-ranging implications. He asks, Phelps, why don't you ever talk about your wife? You're a third of the way through the game, and you didn't even know that your own character was a married man. What else don't you know? Slowly, the game shifts the player's perception of Phelps as their character to seeing him as a completely separate person, one who is keeping secrets of his own. This comes out in interrogations pretty frequently. There are three options when questioning people of interest, truth, doubt, and lie. Originally, these options were labeled coax, force, and lie. The difference is important because Phelps is a serious asshole when selecting the doubt option. It threatens people he knows are clean to get them to cough up information. He says some of the nastiest shit to people. If that option had been more explicitly labeled force, that might not have been so surprising. It's clear that Phelps is not really a very nice person either way. He still does nice things from time to time, he's no sociopath, but he has a deep severity within him, a severity that makes him such a good case man. And a moment of compassion would bring him low. In the second vice case, Phelps lets a boxer who refused to take a dive go free, to Earl's extreme frustration. Most of the force was betting on the fixed outcome of that match. Earl lost himself a ton of money. Phelps might be a bloodhound, but he's not a bloodhound that Earl can keep on a leash. So, Earl starts figuring out how to set Phelps up for a fall. Phelps makes it easy for him. At one point, Phelps ends up back at the Blue Room with Elsa. She isn't connected to the case, but the game says, follow her home anyway. Go up to her apartment. Knock on the door. 
It's an interesting sensation, wondering just what your character thinks he's doing. Still, Elsa takes Phelps into her home and into her bed. This being 1947, adultery is an actual, literal crime. Earl's got everything he needs to sell Phelps down the river. This dovetails with the arc that follows the three main Vice cases. There's two DLC cases, The Naked City and Reefer Madness, but Vice Desk is very short and focused compared to other desks. It revolves around a morphine heist, thousands of surrets of army surplus battlefield morphine that, now that they're hitting the streets, are killing dozens with their purity. It's medicine for battlefield trauma. It was never, ever meant to be used recreationally. And the men from Phelps' old army unit are behind it. A cutscene that plays after the credits reveals it all, and I'm going to discuss that cutscene now for clarity in talking about the game's ending. It's an amazing revelation. Phelps inspired the heist. The men who used to serve under him read about him in the papers, how successful he was in the police department, a cop hero on top of being a war hero. They read that, and they hated him for it. Phelps is no hero. The same things that make him a great caseworker, his meticulousness, his ambition, his commitment to procedure, made him a terrible officer. On the battlefield, told through flashbacks all throughout the game, Phelps fails over and over again to gain the confidence of his troops. They think he's spooky. They think he's bad luck. He admires the Japs, they say. He tries to get inside their heads. Bad luck. Again, one of the things that makes him a great cop, yet that openness to the perspectives of his enemies. But it earned him no love from his men. Phelps was oblivious to the shifting needs of combat. Again and again, Phelps would try to do things by the book when the situation had changed and the book had to be tossed out the window, and men would die because of it. Jack Kelso, a man who served with him, saw this. The troops under him saw this. It all came to a terrible head when Phelps orders a cave cleared by flamethrower. Instead of blowing up the cave entrances like the other units were doing, he was following the army manual which says clear them out with force. That cave wasn't full of soldiers, though. It was a hospital. Cole Phelps, your player character, ordered a massacre of innocents over nothing more than a stubborn misinterpretation over what it means to lead. His men have to clean up, put the wounded out of their misery. Each and every one of those men is now complicit in a war crime because of Phelps. So they shoot him. Not to kill him, but to get him the fuck off the front lines. So the men come home, their war over, they read about Phelps in the paper. Phelps the war hero. Phelps the hero cop. Is that the kind of welcome a pompous war criminal gets? What kind of welcome will the unit get? A last paycheck and a housing subsidy? No, if Phelps got all that undeserving son of a bitch that he is, they deserved more. They deserved a new start after what Phelps put them through. And all those boxes of morphine could pay for that dream. All of it. This isn't remotely clear to Phelps, working with Earl to get to the bottom of where all the morphine is coming from. Courtney Sheldon, one of the heist instigators, has been trying to sell it, but gets an attack of conscience at the last moment when he finds out that people are dying because of it. His business partners don't appreciate that too much, and begin hunting members of Phelps' old unit who are responsible for the heist. That's when Phelps gets involved. It slowly dawns on him, by the last case of the vice desk, that his unit was responsible. He almost learns why. Inches away from the truth, the brass yanks him away. Phelps is off of vice. Soon he'll be off of the force altogether. Earl sold him out. A scandal involving the police chief and others was brewing, and a dirty vice cop cheating on his long-suffering wife with a German jazz singer was a fantastic misdirection for the papers. Phelps is disgraced instead of the brass. Everyone gets away with the morphine heist. Legally, anyway. It's at this point that the game's pacing gets a little weird. If it wasn't for the two DLC cases on Vice Desk, it would be almost as unsatisfying as Homicide Desk in terms of convictions. Reefer Madness, in particular, is a gameplay-heavy break from the story. L.A. Noir's construction is a difficult balancing act in terms of distributing the story this way. As the plot picks up, it pretty much nudges all the tangential cases out of the way. Originally, when the game was being designed, two more desks were going to be included in the game, but they were cut because they wouldn't fit on the disc. I'm not sure if two more desks would have been a great solution. The game is already incredibly long, and I feel like the grander arc of the plot would be completely lost in the intended 11 additional cases. But a few more self-contained cases would have been incredibly welcome in the mid-to-late game. Phelps could have resigned, but he won't. He's been set up, of course, but he's complicit in it. If he hadn't strayed, he wouldn't have given Earl so much to work with. So Phelps gets bumped down to a station house in Wilshire where he used to work arson desk, about as far down the detective ladder as you can get. Arsons are so rarely solved, it's a black hole of police work. Phelps gets assigned to an older cop named Herschel Biggs. Players might recognize him. He's the narrator. 
Weirdly, Biggs only narrates the very beginning of the game. He frames your early experiences as a patrolman and a traffic detective, but he backs off once Phelps is kind of a big shot, lets the plot roll out naturally. Biggs is much more interesting as Phelps' partner than as his narrator anyway. Out of all his partners, Biggs is the only one who ever really tries to understand Phelps. They're actually quite similar. Biggs is a recluse. Usually, he doesn't have a partner at all. He just dutifully works his cases, looking for answers and ashes that have nine, out, nine times out of ten washed those answers away. He has the same approach to police work as Phelps does. Follow the clues, see the big picture, go where it takes you. And he's a former Marine like Phelps. After a particularly grisly encounter with a family burned inside their home, Biggs has a post-traumatic moment. He tells Phelps about back in World War I, a farmhouse where a lot of his friends burned to death. If Phelps stayed on the force for 20 years, being who Phelps is, having a reputation as an unlikable cop and a social misfit, Phelps probably would have ended up a lot like Herschel, sloughing along, doing the only job that really makes sense to him, even if it's a thankless one. When Phelps gets assigned to Biggs, Biggs hates the guy. Everything about Phelps rubs him the wrong way, especially Phelps' ambition. When it starts looking like there might be a connection between a string of house fires in the areas slated for use by the Suburban Re Redevelopment Fund, Phelps tells Big his theory. It's like with the Dahlia, a hunch that's too possible to ignore. Biggs thinks that Phelps just wants back in the limelight, so much so that he's willing to make mountains out of molehills. I wondered that as a player myself. I no longer fully trusted Phelps at this point. He might be the protagonist, but he's not the hero of the story. The hero is Jack Kelso. Kelso has all the qualities of a hero. He's honest, dependable, cool under pressure, and willing to go to any length to right or wrong. Kelso works as a claims investigator at one of LA's biggest insurance firms, and one day this German woman walks in and refuses a massive payout for her late husband. Elsa invited Phelps into her life for her own reasons, but once Phelps was there, Phelps just could not stop being a goddamn detective. As Phelps and Biggs investigate the arsons, it becomes abundantly clear that there is a conspiracy afoot. Phelps discovers that Elsa's ex-husband may have died because of it. So he hatches a plan. Kelso knows what Phelps did during the war. He hates Phelps, has no respect for him. He would never help Phelps, right? So Elsa walks into Kelso's office and puts him on the same trail that Phelps is following. Phelps knows Kelso as well as Kelso knows Phelps. Phelps is crossing his fingers that Kelso is still a good man who won't back down from a challenge. So, when Kelso's boss aggressively tries to put him off of the scent, the deal is closed. Kelso will tie up the loose ends that Phelps can't. So, suddenly, on the game's last desk, L.A. Noir switches the player character right out from under the player's feet and puts them in Kelso's shoes. Those shoes don't fit right. The developers defend the shift by pointing out that Phelps can't really get any farther with his investigation. After he and Biggs confront property developer Lehman Monroe in his own office, Monroe makes sure that Phelps couldn't investigate the dark side of his own ass if it was on fire. It's sensical to switch to Kelso, but sensical doesn't quite cut it for such a huge, unprecedented shift in how the player relates to cases. Kelso eventually, and conveniently, catches the attention of the assistant DA who recruits Kelso to help bring down Monroe's property conspiracy, and in doing so, make the assistant DA's campaign for district attorney proper watertight. It seems Monroe's been burning down his own properties. Monroe called his friend, celebrity psychiatrist Harlan Fontaine, to see if he knew anyone up for a little arson. Fontaine was treating a firebug with PTSD who fit the bill. Poor fella burned a whole hospital back in the war. So now, finally, all the pieces fall into place. To say that L.A. Noire's plot is a slow burn is to put it very mildly. This is a 30 to 40 hour game, and not until these last few hours is the construction of the plot clear at all. Seeing the big picture takes putting together dozens of tiny details and side conversations peppered throughout the entire game. In many ways, L.A. Noir has one big case, and Phelps is the culprit. Hogaboom, the flamethrower operator who Phelps ordered to burn the hospital, never recovered. Like the men who planned the heist, Hogaboom was looking for a way out from under the guilt. That way didn't come from dirty money, though, like with the morphine. It came in the form of purpose. Fontaine, his psychiatrist, said, You burn things. That's who you are. Now you burn things for me. Then Hogaboom tries to burn down a home when the family is still inside. For the second time in his life, following orders led him to the murder of innocents. That breaks him. Quite literally, he suffers a psychotic break, goes rogue, and starts looking to burn the world. It's who he is, isn't he? He kills Fontaine, kidnaps Elsa. Kelso and Phelps pursue him into the sewers of the city. He's the key to the case, after all, the only one who knows enough to crack Monroe's conspiracy wide open. In this last case, there's barely any investigative portion. It ramps up very quickly and ends quite suddenly. 
When the player, as Kelso, finally reaches Hogaboom, Phelps catches up too. There's just enough time for Phelps to see that he's created this monster. He wants to take Hogaboom in, solve his case. Kelso disagrees. Kelso puts Hogaboom out of his misery, and Hogaboom welcomes it. Then the water surges through the storm drains as they flee. Phelps helps Elsa to safety, Kelso to safety, and then he dies. Phelps says goodbye, quite literally, and the water takes him. Kelso has enough evidence to take down Monroe, but everyone else gets away with it. Roy Earl gives the eulogy at Phelps' funeral. The status quo is preserved, the corrupt continue to help themselves, and life moves on with or without justice. The city moves on. The city endures. There's eight million stories in the Naked City. This has been one of them. But is it the right ending for L.A. Noir? Is it a satisfying ending? To answer that, we have to look at another movie that left an indelible mark on L.A. Noir's construction, 1974's Chinatown. Although it was made decades after the heyday of noir cinema, Chinatown is considered a classic example of the genre. With good reason, it's simply an amazing movie. And where the Naked City influenced the form and format of the procedural gameplay of L.A. Noir, it's Chinatown that influenced the plot. The movie is called Chinatown, but the action never moves that direction until the very last scene. Instead, Chinatown hangs over the head of Jake Giddes, the protagonist, in every scene metaphorically. Years ago, Giddes was a cop in Chinatown, literally. He was surrounded by crooked cops and bad deeds, and he let a woman he cared about very much get killed over it. It's what drove him to quit the force and become a P.I. Over the course of Chinatown the movie, he comes to care about another woman very much, and inadvertently leads her right to her grave. The last scene of Chinatown sees all of Giddes' dreams crushed in an instant, his good intentions turned sour. He solves the mystery, tries to be a better man than he is to help the aggrieved. That doesn't matter. As he's being led away from the corpse of the woman he's come to love over the course of the movie, a cop buddy drapes his arm over Jake's shoulder. Forget it, Jake, he says. It's Chinatown. What's he mean by that? Well, he means two things. First, that you can never run from your past. Second, that the past will repeat itself again and again, even or especially its most horrible parts. Jake never forgot Chinatown the first time. It ruined him. And now he is ruined again. That's noir for you. From this angle, the ending of L.A. Noir is pretty much pitch perfect. The climactic decision is not truth, doubt, lie, but Phelps' decision to let Kelso kill Hogaboom. If they had delayed any more, they all would have died down there in the storm drains. Hogaboom can't help but repeat the past. Will Phelps repeat the past? Will he doom them all out of pride, trying to close his case? No. He lets it go. And if L.A. Noir had been the length of a movie, that would have been a great ending. It would have been easier to see what was thematically going on. As the ending of a 40-hour game, though, it's a bit of a major stumble. The problem with it is the lack of player input. If the case had been twice as long and featured actual casework, it would have been twice as satisfying. Instead, it's so sudden as to be almost confusing. It's a deliberate anticlimax. All the loose strings of the plot are tied up, but then the knot is cut. Some of the villains are punished, but you really can't fight City Hall. And, like Chinatown, the growth of the city of Los Angeles itself is made into a villain and an engine of suffering. In Chinatown, it's the theft of water from the Owens River Valley. In L.A. Noir, it's the freeway system. Monroe builds the homes out of kindling directly in the path of the freeway, increases their insurance value, and then sells them back to the city for so much more than he ever invested in the properties. A victimless crime. Except it never quite works out that way, does it? The game reaches a climax before the climax in Arson Desk's only DLC case, Nicholson Electroplating. It's what I've been wanting, a big, self-contained case with Phelps and Biggs. It's also the last case that Phelps ever closes before his death, and the papers say it's one of the crimes of the century. In it, a massive explosion rocks the city. You're one of the first responders. It's a factory explosion, dozens dead and wounded. What unravels is a tale of espionage involving Howard Hughes Aircraft Company and a former vice cop who is to Earl what Biggs is to Phelps a vision of what they might look like later in life if they continued down their paths. It's everything that's truly admirable and lovable about L.A. Noir. Exciting use of historical figures and events, nuanced and deep character interactions, great action set pieces, and gameplay so rooted in classic police procedurals you'd swear that you could smell the pencil shavings. It's an embodiment of the best of the game. And even if it isn't the very last part of the game, it is Phelps' last and greatest case. It's a good end, and a good farewell. Better than Phelps' resigned and meek final goodbye, at least in terms of L.A. Noir as a game. As a piece of noir media, like a film, the ending as it is works perfectly. I'm not the only one who thinks so. The game was a critical and commercial success, although Team Bondi, who developed the game, had a turbulent relationship with the publisher Rockstar Games, and Bondi was shuttered following releasing just this one title. 
They were bought quickly, though, and are working on a new game called Horror of the Orient, which will supposedly also be a contemporary high-budget adventure title in the vein of L.A. Noire. I hope it is. There hasn't been another game quite like L.A. Noire, not before it, and not since. L.A. Noir literally created a template for making police procedurals a viable game format in addition to being a format for over 50 years of novels, movies, and television series. L.A. Noir funded development of some of the most robust facial capture technology ever made. It inverted the entire structure of GTA derivative games and made them into something considered, gorgeous, and brilliant. L.A. Noir is a game that I will always love. Give it a try and I think you'll love it too. Thanks for watching. I'd like to take some time to thank by name some people who are donating $10 or more a month to me on Patreon. The money is incredibly helpful and I'm really grateful. Some of those people include Jonas Neefs, Cassie Bayer, Pat Hay, Connor Biblo, Joshua Hartnett, Brad Wallace, Ryan Gunst, Preston Allen, Espen Steinsnez, Zoe Sheik, Sigmund Kapparud, Stephen Lark, Junas, Amir Aguilar, Christian Zacharyanson, Ken Young, William Kreusch, Akan Seigalguio, Richard Stevenson, Stephen Persson, Signe Jensen, Kimmo Heikkinen, Jay Schmitz, Joe Wolf, Oliver H., White Zero, Yuri Petrus, Sil, Dalton Seiler, Carlos Perea, and Jonathan Fleischinger. And thanks also to everyone else who's currently donating to me on Patreon. Thank you for watching.